maybe it's just my perception, but it sure seems like a reality is like every single property that can be hunted in the United States is being hunted by one or more guys. <laughs> every <laughs> single property. Hunters. How is <laughs> it possible? And yet we're a minority. It's like we're. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800-pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year yeah, and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost And we know that we walk away when we come back, it's going to be a great looking food plot. For anybody that's looking to try Deer Grow, if you use the code HUNTER15, that's H-U-N-T-R-1-5 at checkout for DeerGrow.com, you're gonna save 15% on any of your Deer Grow products. It's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself. Better food plots, bigger deer. And we're back. Hey, Hunter Podcast, episode 154. Nick keeps us in line. (sighs) Usa. It's your part now. We appreciate you guys <laughs> listening. Uh, wherever you're listening to, YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast, we appreciate you guys. If you want to take a minute, give us a follow, uh, in- engage with one of our podcasts. We do see those comments. We read them from time to time, and uh, we appreciate the feedback. So thank you guys. Good tree stand reading material if we feel like it mm-hmm. and have service. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, if you're listening to this, it is Halloween. <clears throat> Ooh, Ooh. Spooky. Uh, and if we is this dropping, are we going to try to do a live? At yeah, the same I was going to say if we're actually uh, so put this on pause and jump over, and we're probably doing a live. What? Well, oh no, it'll, it'll be, be a, after this. It'll be in just a little bit. Yep. So two, right after this, nine thirty Eastern time. Yeah, yeah. So about three hours from now, ballpark. Eight thirty Central, nine thirty Eastern. Yep. We're going to do a, a YouTube live. Jared and I will be in Illinois, yep. and so we'll be at the our Airbnb, maybe celebrating. I don't know, possibly. We're hunting a heck of a front, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but it'll be our first hunt on the new farm. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to do – everybody's kind of been asking about it, so we figured we'll do YouTube Live. I don't know what we're going to talk about or what we're, we're going to pro- do. We'll probably just like a- read – like uh comments trashing us and stuff yeah. and like uh oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could do a little like uh, – We will be drinking beer, that's Q&A. for sure. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in Q&A. preparation, we'll, we'll open it up. Yeah. I just, just, I mean, dude, like these, we'll run it pretty loose. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll just see if anybody jumps. See if anybody jumps on, and we'll, you know, people want to just tell us how much they hate us and stuff. That'd be fine. We'll yeah, feel, we'll be, we'll, we'll be sitting in an old farmhouse. <laughs> we'll feel that relaxing, you know. So yeah, uh, major front. So uh, this week, because today's twenty sixth, uh, it's been warm, like sunburn warm. Uh, well, just right now, it's warm. Yeah, the yeah. last couple days. Yeah. Um, we had some good hunts there, whatever that was, the 20, uh, 20, 20th, 21st, yeah, something like that. Yeah, a mm-hmm. couple real good hunts. Yep. Monday was pretty good. We had good weather, and then Tuesday it started to kind of increase warmer. Yep. Um, I've seen— We're back, we're backed out now. It's just funny. Everybody's—you know, anybody—I mean, my friends, anyways, are following the same trends because it's like I start getting phone calls. Sure. All of a sudden, when it starts getting warm again, they're like, yeah— Pulled out, you know, pulled out and mm-hmm. catching up on emails and stuff. I'm like, I this we're doing the same thing here. We got like yeah. a, now through the 29th or something like that is, you know, it's just. I mean, I don't. I mean, our guest who we're gonna have on here in a minute shot one on, on a warm front, but we of it's, course it's, he did. It slowed right <laughs> up for us, dude. I was really excited to hear that he shot one. I mean, the timing worked out perfectly because yeah. we already had a schedule to come on. It's it's Don Higgins is our guest. Yeah, you yeah. sent me a picture. You're like, hey, Don just posted Well, I this. saw the thing on TikTok, and it's like a giant has fallen. I was like, oh, snap. Because you know when Don shoots one, so I was like, it, 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 I'm it's sure a it's one. a giant. Yeah. yeah. So I was anxious to see that, and it sounds like it was his, his uh, target deer bait that we've all been kind of following. Well, and it's kind of cool because, you know, even pre-podcast, he said it like, you know, he kind of planned to really get on that deer here with this major cold front coming through. I mean, because we're going, I, I looked, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but our farm in Illinois is going to be like 82 or something. Mm-hmm. 
And then and we got like a half inch of rain at least last night. I mean, it's yeah. this low pressure system is moving through. And then Monday we're get, it's going to be high. Of we're 40. getting some precip here and there, and it's starting like Saturday is going to start falling. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, for for me, it's I don't those rain days. I'm just they don't seem to move as my, it's like afterwards. It's interesting. Once yeah. once that pressure starts to come back up, and that you just feel that crispness, the bluebirds, mm-hmm. you know, sky. That's mm, mm-hmm. on on a on a Halloween day. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah, well. You're, if you're listening to this Dude. at six o'clock, Jared and I are probably that's might like have shot one already. We we're, we'd be in the sand right now. We've got some shooters, not like an overwhelming amount, but like I would say, I'd say floppy and that deer last night are for sure shooters. Mm-hmm. We've also got some slammer four year olds that I mean we haven't talked about, but I think we're gonna you want to try to pass them. Yeah, although I might have my recurve the whole time. Okay. Oh, whatever, dude. There's there's enough there mm. that we can kind of get an assessment. I would assume we'll see some new bucks show up here. We've been we've been on an increasing trend here lately. As the corn comes oh, yeah. down around us, we're getting new bucks they're, coming in. They're popping. I don't yeah. think that is that nine point, dude. I think it's different deer. Different deer. Mm-hmm. So maybe there's three or four. Mm-hmm. There's at least three or four mature deer that we've seen come up. Telling a difference between each of those is going to be tough because it's like a bunch of eight and nine yeah. points. Yeah. We're meeting all the neighbors, too. I mean, there's <laughs> dogs and horses and trucks and youth hunters and stuff running all, like, amok. That's my slight rant for this week. So, uh, it's been a rough week uh, in terms of just, just <laughs> overall. Um, I've had, uh, between my properties, I said, and I'm not kidding, every farm I own has had random dogs running on it this week. Every farm. Wow. Like, I don't know if it's just let your dogs run free week or If it makes you feel any what? better, I'm going to say most farms do have random dogs running on them from time to time. Ugh, I don't like it. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it doesn't feel good. I, <laughs> I personally think the deer, like, you know, depending on how frequent it is and how, I don't think them dogs run up through all the timber and stuff. They ran basically the correct bottom and then mm. back out. It's mm. definitely a ruckus. I mean, that's, it's not good. Mm. And it will blow a hunt. That's the main mm. thing. It's like we drive out there 10 hours and it's like, the, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. Like it's it. not great. So I had that. I had a uh, one thirty a.m. F- side by side drive through my Kentucky property. Mm. The new like one or the the cabin? new one? Yeah, right through. Right what out. What they were doing one thirty a.m. That's probably just. That they're probably just part crackheads. <laughs> poaching. Yeah, maybe poaching. <laughs> yeah, very possible. Dude, um, speaking of crackheads, I saw some re- actual real life crackheads the other day. Yeah, we went to so. I don't want to derail your story. Sure. No, no, no. If I can, it's though, probably one in the same. Real quick, we were coming home from the farm the other corner I was, yeah. and I've been I've been talking up my my new um my kind of my thing is like I get a craving for chocolate milk on the way home from okay. the farm. Uh huh. And at some point, and I so I hit up the DGs from mm-hmm. kind of the Dollar Generals, and I'm always in just mm. my Long Johns and my Crocs. Yeah, yeah. So if, so you fit in. If any of the DGs <laughs> talk to one another, they know they're like, "There's a guy that's been stopping in in Long Johns and Crocs." And he just asked, probably not the only one. And he just asked for chocolate milk. Most well, have pajamas so on. So <laughs> the exit that I planned to get off on, because we needed gas. Mm-hmm. And so it was a good opportunity for chocolate milk. Mm-hmm. So this was just a day or two ago. So we st- we I missed the exit, and it, I kind of forgot. And mm-hmm. then we got off. It's it's East Liverpool is where oh, I yeah. So we're yep. coming through there. And, I mean, I don't, I'm not super – and I'm not throwing shade on the town in general. But, like, the, the GPS took us to a BP in uh, – East Liverpool, mm-hmm. and we so we go to the BP, and I'm like looking. I'm like, this is kind of not great, you know. Shady. It's a, it's you know, it's fine, but so pull in there, get gas, go into the gas station. And it's like I don't know. It's just kind of weird. Guys, people are looking at me and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was like, it's, it's me and Corey, and so we pull out of there, and I noticed the DG on the way in. So it's just five minutes down the street. Dude, the DG was like, I don't know, Sp- Spidey senses for tangling for sure. But I was like, gotta get that. Mm-hmm. The fair life is what I've been drinking. Oh yeah, half the sugar, yeah. twice the protein. Yeah, I know that's what at. they say. Mm-hmm. So, that's what they say. So, and it, and I also had in my mind, I was like, Corey and I aren't just gonna drink the sa- you know the same thing the whole time. And a few sips is fine, but sure. at some point it's kind of gay, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, he's at least got have a straw, right? So I, so I had to look for cups also. And but dude, as I'm walking in, at, like actual crackheads are mumbling at me and stuff. And oh like, wow! And they're sitting around. There's like random bat, like real drug activity. These are military age males, like sitting around. Oh wow! DG. So yeah, scurried in, scurried out. Got the fair life. Got the they got the milks and stuff, and uh, or the cups, and we we made it out scot free. But it it was a bit. You know, I went. I went to a gas station in rural Tennessee when Emily was running the race last weekend, and uh, I was the only one of ten people not smoking a cigarette inside the gas station. Oh wow! It was like mm. it took me back to like the eighties, basically. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So I like walked in. I was like, 
Okay. Seems hey. like a fire hazard. Yeah. I don't think they really cared. <laughs> Shut up, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> it was cloudy in there, for yeah. sure. So, um, yeah. It's America. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it felt Pretty like. Pretty soon it's going to be a commu- communist country. You ever see them commercials where they first are saying you can't drink in your car? And stuff, and they're like, I don't think so. I can't just drink a beer in my car on the way home. Pretty soon, this will be a communist country. <laughs> Sounds about right. Remember passing laws like I wear seatbelts and stuff? Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, somebody, I saw somebody the other day that uh, <laughs> they had like, it was like an open Jeep, but they had a recliner for the seat, like an actual, like, lazy boy recliner. Oh, for yeah. the seat. I, no yeah, seatbelt for it's that. It's kind of nice. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> just recline that bad boy. Mm. I think it was in the same Jeep area. owners are a so. different breed. Uh, but anyways, yeah, it's Halloween. Uh, hard to believe that October's over uh, and November's staring us in the face here. And uh, But, yeah, we've got Don Higgins to kind of fill us in on this stage of, of pre-rut into rut, you know, which is probably, uh, I don't want to say misunderstood, but I think a lot of people um, get super excited for a very short period of time in the beginning of November. And then, you know, for most of what the Midwest and Northeast sometime end of first week, early second week in November, start to feel a little lockdown. Maybe. Uh, we've, we've seen some running out. I, for sure. There's some does that have come into heat. Mm -hmm. We've seen some, you know, decent age class bucks chasing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it really is tied to the weather. I mean, you know, and it's still kind the of, rutting. I mean, yeah. it's gonna happen whether it happens at night or not. Like it, they're going to breed. It's just, are you gonna see it or not? Because it's you know seventy five degrees out. Yeah, that's what it really comes down to. Yeah. So, want to bring Don in? All right, Don, we got you. You got me. All right, sir. Appreciate you coming on this morning and. Yeah, I probably feel a little bit of uh, pressure off the shoulders after this week for you, huh? It's been a good week for sure. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to, I always like to get at least one buck tagged, you know, before we get too far into the season, but, uh, don't always happen that way. And if it don't, that's fine. But, uh, you know, it, it definitely changes the dynamics of your season. If you get a good one tagged early, hundred percent, yeah. you can, uh, oh, you can just kind of, at ease a lot more there's no pressure on you whatsoever not that i feel the pressure that much because i i don't mind going a season without killing a deer the last two i did not shoot a buck um obviously i could have but the older i get the more i enjoy just getting video footage of these bucks and, and trying to put the history together over a number of years with an individual buck and uh, I, I get a thrill out of that about as much as I do shooting them. So it doesn't bother me not to shoot a buck, but once you do, definitely the pressure is off. Yeah. What uh, <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> what, I so Don, I shot one on September sixth. So I I feel it. Well, I'm trying not to rub it in Jerry because I know Jerry's starting to feel a little angsty here. Like yeah. you know. Time, you know, time slipping that, away. There is plenty of time, though. That's what Don was going to say next, yeah. I'm pretty sure. is. But you yeah. got plenty of time. Yeah, that's so, my rant on so, the dogs on the farm. So don't fret. Today, so don't so. fret. You know, there's plenty of time here. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the best days of the season are ahead of us. In fact, you know, I think the, the late season is the very best time to shoot a good buck. I think it's way better than the rut. Um, yeah. Especially if you're targeting a specific buck. Mm-hmm. Now, if you just want to shoot a buck, then yeah, the rut's great. But if you want to target a specific buck, the late season is the time to get it done. Yeah. Don, what would you say is, you know, what is the likelihood? I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to keep track or, I mean, just generally in your head, like what is the likelihood that if you pass bucks or, you know, j- just in general that they're going to get through f- from year to year? I mean, do you, do you pass deer in confidence that's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to see that deer again? Or is it like it's mm-hmm. a slim chance? Well, it used to be that I felt if I got a buck through gun season when he was a three and a half year old, that my odds of seeing that buck when he was five and six were very good because between three and four, they make a big jump in their habits as far as their survival. They, they just, so many more of them survive. That's really all changed though here in recent years. My home state of Illinois legalized crossbows for everyone during the entire archery season is either two or three years ago and it literally has decimated our buck herd um you know there's a saying that a mature buck can take care of himself well the problem is there's no more mature bucks and 
<laughs> I run a lot of trail cameras across a lot of country and uh, the miles between four-year-old and older bucks is just increased greatly. They're, mm -hmm. they're really tough to find anymore uh, because of the pressure. Uh, you know, two and three-year-old bucks are just so vulnerable. And the, what the crossbow has done is it's brought every gun hunter just about into archery season for three and a half months. So instead of those guys getting seven days to hunt, now they get three and a half months to hunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the crossbow is, is a lot easier to shoot. You know, a lot of them have scopes on them and, you know, guys can master them without much practice. And it's just really hard on the buck herd. And you now I want to stress that I'm not anti-crossbow. I am anti-crossbow in the entire archery season for able-bodied men. Um, for someone with a physical military age men or, as I call or them. age or whatever <laughs> i'm fine with them using a crossbow during archery season but yeah yeah when you throw it in there for everyone um it has a, a big negative impact and what it's really done is it's turned it's turned trophy hunting into a rich man's game and you know i'm blessed and, and fortunate that, that i can own hunting property so I'm going to have mature bucks to hunt. Mm -hmm. It's not going to affect me personally as much as it is, you know, the, the younger guys. I, I feel really bad for the guys that are, say, 20 years older in that range that are just ate up with chasing big deer like I was at that age. They're not going to have the opportunities that I had. Yeah. It's uh, the, the whole – and there's a number of factors that, that have caused that, the crossbow being one of them but I feel really bad for those guys because it has become a rich man's game, whether anybody wants to admit it or not. And it's going to continue in that direction. Yeah. The price of hunting land, you know, in my neck of the woods has <clears throat> just absolutely skyrocketed along with all land, farmland, whatever. But if you can find anything 5,000 an acre or less, you better be buying it because in, in a couple of years, it's going to be 8,000. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the interest rates, I know I'm jumping all over the board here. No, run with it, dude. <laughs> interest rates, you know, have gone up, but I was talking to my banker about uh, potentially buying some more property, and he was telling me that, yeah, the interest rates are up, but the price of land is climbing faster than the interest rates. So you'd be yep. better off to buy it today with the high interest rates and pay those high interest rates than to think that you can wait um a few years down the road because a few years down the road it's going to be so much more expensive mm -hmm. that the interest rates are really not going to have a negative impact to buy now yeah it's crazy to think that we we've even been seeing obviously so jared and i bought a farm in illinois and i've, I've been doing some research even in the area that we're at you know i've seen a couple pieces of ground sell for north of 8500 an acre for recreational ground mm -hmm. um and and of course it does have Some tillable trouble. on it right but i mean it it's it's kind of hard to believe like in the last three years what that's done and to your point on like yeah nobody really wants to pay a seven and a half or eight percent interest rate but if that continues to climb at a you know two three four hundred dollar per acre type of growth um you know, it, it makes it really, really difficult to say, you know, if I don't stop it now, what am I going to end up paying in 16 months or 18 months from now? We've had a lot of conversations around like the drivers of that. And it, the, the more we talk about it, it seems to be like largely misunderstood by or, or not even, uh, um, con, you know, considered by, the you know, the, the legislators that are passing the law is like, the dynamic seems to be that if we continue to pass things that make hunting easier, crossbows being a great example for that, uh, it's going to cause people who have means of insulating themselves from that. So people, you know, financially well off people to just buy up more of the land. Yeah. You know, and that's in direct competition with the state who wants to provide more access, you know, public access. So if the state comes and say, hey, we'll buy up ground for, you know, we'll pay you 5,500 an acre. And there's guys out there that will pay 85 an acre to insulate themselves from nonsense like crossbow seasons and in, in the state of Ohio baiting is, I, I think, the biggest issue. That's what's happening. So 
So while it seems like, oh, they gave us crossbows, oh, they gave us, you know, these things, we're getting more more access, more ability to kill deer. The reality is that on the macro level, there are way less mature deer ever, you know, because of those reasons. And the, the long-term uh, effect is that these these land these people that can afford to buy land are continue to buy it up and insulate themselves from that, that kind of nonsense. Mm-hmm. And, and that's exactly what I was saying. It's becoming more and more a rich man's sport. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not talking... I mean, we're talking to the, getting to the point where a guy can't even afford a 40 acre tract of land. Oh, dude. I mean, if he's got a house payment and he's got kids and, and he's working a real job and his wife's working a real job, 40 acres has just become out of reach for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the sad thing is, is that I think hunters themselves drive a lot of this because (laughs) as you mentioned, every time the state comes along with some proposed regulation change to make things easier you've got a lot of hunters that, that are all for it. Yep. Yeah. Hey, I want to hunt with a crossbow. Well, you know, or, what it, What is it uh, in, do you know what it is in Illinois? Don? I know in Ohio or no, 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 forgive me. Yeah. Ohio. So granted, it's not a, every one of these regulations and the times mm-hmm. that they've implemented them are different in Ohio, 70%, more than 70% of the archery harvest is with a crossbow. Mm-hmm. And so maybe use another example, like was it Minnesota that just recently they're in their first year. Yep. And I think already, 40% of the archery 40%. harvest? 40%. Within, maybe by the end of the year, that'll be over 60%. Well, and in, in Pennsylvania, I think Brian Burhans, the director, told us it was 50-50, right? 50, 50% crossbow, 50% vertical. Yeah. Well, but, you know, Pennsylvania is an interesting one, like, you know, because it seems to be one of the few states where guys are seeing better deer. We're enhancing, but that's because we have less hunters, dramatically less hunters than we used to have. But still more than any other state. Um. More than most you, states. You guys also started a way lower in the quality of your deer herd. Oh, yeah. I mean, true, uh, true, true, true. 95% of the bucks we killed were one and a half, mm-hmm. you know, for many years, my entire life growing up, you know, so when people see a two or a three-year-old buck, that's a, that's a big buck to them in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. where, you know, we step into the Midwest and, you know, those two and three-year-olds, people don't even flinch at mm-hmm. unless, you know, it, it's kind of weird. We've heard this whole... Um, you know, it's becoming a rich man sport. It's becoming a rich man sport. And and it's it's difficult for guys like us who are all very passionate about this resource to look at, to your point, you know, uh, a state implementing these things and then people acquiring land at, you know, what would seem to be absurd prices for, for recreational land to insulate them from these things. It's two opposing forces that, um, it, you know, are, it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight. Right. Like they're going to continue to try to liberalize hunting. And at the same time, well, that, that's, guys will pay whatever they can afford. That's what it is. To there, there has to hit a, there, you have to hit a breaking point. Where it's, it's not that hard to see. It's like, OK, the easier hunting is, you know, the more people who are willing to pay for good hunting ground will pay to to yep. to have it. You know, and that's that is that's literally when you say hunting's a rich man sport it's everybody that can't afford to buy land is getting kicked off by people who it's are leasing or, yeah. or people people are buying your yep. access is is gone going yep. going gone yep and i think man if you if you could address that liberalization of the sea of the the seasons you know that's mm-hmm. that's your i mean even to the point of you know cell cams is the thing that makes it i mean if you're going to throw everything in the pot you sure. know cell cams baiting crossbows liberal gun seasons all of those are those are the reasons that the three of us sitting here are buying land mm-hmm. because if those things were regulated more, we wouldn't have to have such a tight, you know, an aggressive response to like you know buy things that we can control completely. In yeah. fact, the 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 total f- opposite side of that is I would if our resource on the land that we did own or had mm-hmm. access to was so plentiful as I would want to I would want to bring people I would want to. Well, that I mean, that was, that was the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s for a lot of us is that, you know, when I when I was growing up hunting in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, you could hunt. I mean, you had permission access to a ton of Not ground, even especially during, you just go wherever you want, especially during bow season, because they're you know, we and I'm growing up in a time where we had a million to a million, 1.1 million hunters in Pennsylvania. Right. But most of those were rifle guys of which we had 10 days to hunt. Right. And so during archery season, I mean, you could get permission all over the place. I mean, you in deer yeah. were you didn't have conflicts. People weren't out buying land because, you know, you, you could just go and hunt wherever you want. Well, not nearly hunt. as many people were bow hunting either. I mean, if you look at the numbers, I bet there were still a lot of 
bow hunters, like vertical bow hunters. I bet it was very comparable. Yeah, but they were far less effective. Sure. Yeah. You know, the frustrating part for me is as I watch this unfold, you know, I've been hunting since the, the late seventies, the deer hunting. And so I've seen the whole, the whole culture across the country change. And I think each state kind of has its own culture within the culture, but for sure. the, the frustrating thing that I see is, is the, the people that are trying to improve deer hunting for everyone are, are guys like the three of us. Mm -hmm. We're guys, we can afford land. We, we're protected. You know, it doesn't matter. We're going to have a place to deer hunt. Yep. We're the, the guys that we're trying to help are, we're trying to help everybody. We're trying to help the sport in general, the next generation coming up and the guys that will benefit the most from our efforts are the guys that we're fighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, to get the weekend warrior guy that does not own land, um, is not quite as serious. I know we're trying to make things better for his kids. Yes. And he's so, and this, I'm generalizing, you know, everybody's not like this, but a, a lot of those guys are so short sighted. They can't even see that what they're pushing for is going to affect their kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. And the guys that have the least to gain are, are us, you know, us landowners, us folks that can afford land. We've got the least to gain. And yet we're the ones on the front line fighting the battles. I know you guys are involved with a, group out in Ohio that's trying to change things. I've been involved or was involved for a number of years with the Illinois Bow Hunters Society as mm -hmm. a, a member of their board of directors, you know, fighting DNR and various regulations. And it's always been, and I, I've still got haters to this day <laughs> for things that I was trying to do to help the entire, yeah. you know, bow hunting community. And I, I've had a place to hunt for a number of years. And yet it's the guys that have the least to gain that are on the front lines doing the most. And the guys that have the most to gain are sitting at the back, taking advantage of every opportunity to kill more deer, mm -hmm. use easier weapons or easier tools. It's kind of frustrating for, for me to sit back and watch that. It oh, is. I can imagine. <clears throat> Dude, how did that, um, were you involved in like, so you said Illinois passed this crossbows two, three years ago. Was that during your, uh, were, were you on the board at that time? Was that something that was, no. you guys were fighting? I, I got off of that at least 10 years ago. It, it was just a no win battle here in this mm -hmm. liberal state. Um, anything the DNR wanted, the, the state legislature was going to give them. Um, so they, they were managing for money and, and you know how corrupt Illinois is. Sure. You know, insurance lobby throws some money at, so you vote this way to increase deer harvest and we're going to kick some money to your campaign or whatever. And sure. There's no way to fight that. You know, the, the good thing that I'm hearing about the Ohio group is that they're hiring a lobbyist. The only way yeah, that's to, it. To, to battle this is you've got to have a lobbyist, a paid lobbyist yeah. and they're expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that out at the very end of my tenure. How, how expensive, Don? We haven't, you know, sounds like 30, 30, $35,000 is kind of what gets it done for an issue. For an issue. That's coming from Skip's, you know, Skip's Live has been on recently and we've talked. So he's active in Iowa. You know, yeah. uh, I know he's connected with the guys in Ohio and tried to give them some advice. But that's, you know, in terms of a, a simple route, because a lot of us sit back and say, well, this sucks. How do we make it better? Literally, the point of that organization is going to be to crowdsource funds, to pay for a lobbyist, to address, I think in Ohio, baiting is the primary issue, but in other states, it might be, you know, crossbows or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a price tag. I know uh, there was a group in, in Illinois that I met with a few years ago that was going to hire a lobbyist. Um, they were a bunch of business owners that were, you know, big time landowners and deer hunters and, um, it basically fell apart for for lack of interest but i think at that time we was probably looking at about 50 grand mm -hmm. and uh. when you're talking that kind of number you're talking about one issue and then it's not guaranteed that you're going to get it pushed through <laughs> right consider the the money that like uh, the insurance lobbies have um the farm bureau was a big one in illinois that we had to battle um those kind of institutions have way more money than the hunter and they're well better organized than the hunters ever will be. I mean, we can't sure. even agree on having crossbows in archery season. Sure. Okay. And you start trying to change the whole culture. And, and let's just say that baiting became illegal in Ohio. 
it's not going to stop overnight. Sure. It, it, it's just not. Yeah. You know, that's been ingrained in those people for generations. And there's going to be people that just have the idea that, hey, it, it, we've always done it. We're always going to do it. The state's not going to tell me what to do on my own land. It's going to take at least a decade to turn that just that one issue around in Ohio. Yeah, no well, doubt. Well, one thing that we found interesting, Don, is <clears throat> when we bought this new property, much like anything, you know, you're getting used to figuring out the the <clears throat> way that everything lays. You're figuring out your neighbors. We've had multiple neighbors come up to us and say, hey, just so you guys know, uh, Illinois has a property boundary law to where you can't hunt within a certain distance, 50 yards, 50 yards of it. And it was on the table in 2013, I think. Yeah. Well, and to be clear, the reason that those issues came up is like the way that our farm sets is, <clears throat> I mean, Jeremy and I are, are, I like to think we're good guys, right? We want to, yeah. we want to cooperate with our neighbors and stuff. We're, we're not in the habit of just hunting property lines to hunt. Pro I mean, and some people are, it's gra grass is greener on the other side, but literally the way that this farm sets up is like all of the, the huntable spots are pretty much on the perimeters of the farm. The yeah. It's, there's a lot of agriculture. Mm -hmm. The interiors are like bigger CRP fields and stuff like that. So we're limited to, to tree lines and areas that we can tuck food plots in and stuff. So, so that's the reason for, and in some cases there are no trees on our side of the fence line. So, you know, we have to default to a blind that that's on that side mm -hmm. of it there. And that's what caused, uh, you know, one of one of the phone calls that we had with the neighbors. And, and the first thing, out of, like you're saying, is there's like, hey, just so you know, there's this law in Illinois and you got to be 50 yards from the tree line. So we had to call the warden. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, did that law actually pass? No, no, there is no I law. Say, I, I didn't think so. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Frankly, we might not have bought the farm if that was a law. Like, yeah, I mean, when, yeah. when we first had heard it from one of the neighbors, it was like, whoa, if, th if this is true, like it completely blows up some of our strategy for why we bought this farm. And we made a call to the warden. The warden said no. Like, it, it got tabled immediately. It never went through. But if you Google it, it's one of the first things that comes up. And if you don't read it, it, it right. says in there that it had been you tabled. You can find it, it but if passed. you don't know what it means that the table issue was tabled or something, then you just assume that's the yeah. law. And, and a so, lot of people do, I think. So, but those are the mm -hmm. things that, you know, continue to come up is like, listen, at some point, somebody went after that specific issue yeah. of saying, hey, we're going to, and I mean, you talk about an agricultural based state like Illinois. I mean, that changes the way that 80% of the hunters hunt a farm in, in the state of that, Illinois. It doesn't seem like a passable law to me. I mean, that that's a pretty direct no. infringement on landowner rights. Correct. Exactly. Which is why it got tabled. Stand up the Supreme Court challenge. Yeah, that's why it got tabled. So, but, it, you know, those are the things that it, even just in a brief conflict with a potential neighbor, you know, that comes up. And, you, you know, one of the first things you have to say is, sorry, man, like, no, that's not true. Here's why. Yeah, right. And they've, they've operated probably for 10 years thinking it was a law. Good to have the information, you know. Yeah. Get the facts. Yeah. Still be neighborly. You know, yeah. we, we I say, hey, listen, if if that's an issue, if we need to resolve that, we'll let's we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. But just so you know, that's not a law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the I can tell you story after story about some of my experiences when I was involved with Illinois bow hunters, and we would testify in front of the legislature, the J Car Committee, Joint Committee on Administrative Rural. So the legislature, every time a a law is passed, the entire legislature doesn't always vote on it. There's various committees, like there's the Ag and Conservation Committee in Illinois, and that committee is made up of about a dozen or so legislators from both sides. But I, I actually testified one time in Springfield on, a, on an issue, and, you know, these 12 legislators are, are sitting right in front of you in two rows of six facing you, and uh, th there's like a... a moderator or whatever calling people up to testify well in this particular on this particular morning um these legislators come in you know one at a time or what whatever and they sit down waiting on the meeting to start this one guy comes in and uh black guy with his morning newspaper sits there in front of me reading his morning newspapers i'm testifying that guy was barack obama <laughs> no way I, I literally I, I testified in front of a JCAR committee that Barack Obama was on. He sat probably 20 feet in front of me reading a newspaper as I testified. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it, it's all. Can you record that it, kind of stuff? Are you allowed to record and could you post that to your uh, own? Session? I'm not sure if you can. And, and this is a long time. This was when he was a state. This was, yeah, right. was president. This was when he was a state senator. Right. Um, it, it, it's a farce because it, it's just a. Uh, I don't know what you call it. It's just a, 
the, the decision's already been made. Yeah, it's just a process. Money. They ha- they have yeah, to do exactly. it. They have to hold the hearing. They have to give you your chance to speak. But they've already made their mind up. It's a done right. deal. It's been sealed behind exactly. closed doors. It was a waste of my, I, I got tired of driving to Springfield, wasting my time because it'd take me an entire day to drive there, do whatever I had to do, drive home. I'd waste a day trying to help every deer hunter in the state of Illinois, both bow hunters and gun hunters. And the hate that I got from people who disagreed on this particular issue, you know, I, I may have testified for a dozen different issues over the years, but some guy would disagree with me. Some other hunter would disagree with me on one issue and all of a sudden the hate was fired my way and he was not going to support me on anything else, even if we was on the same side. And so the whole Illinois bow hunter society kind of, it was kind of a contentious issue, you know, with, with Illinois bow hunters, because somebody would get mad about one issue Mm -hmm. and then they would just hate the organization and bash the organization. It just, it it was not even worth the battle. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's a shame. And, I, I, you know, I think that's where, you know, to the to the f- defense of some of these agencies, you know, people kind of really want to take it out on them. And frankly, you know, those ag- agencies are just, you know, underneath puppet strings that are being pulled from the legislature. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you can complain a lot like a lot of people complain about the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We need this. We should do this. We need Sunday hunting. Yeah. They don't have a control. Well, over frankly, that. They, sh- they should be looked at as allies of like these, you know, because if you get something past like, uh, you know, let's say. For instance, if we could get baiting, you know, banned in Ohio, the same money that's being raised to hire that lobbyist to get the pass in initially should then go towards the enforcement of that. It should be, mm-hmm. in some cases, you know, don- donated to uh, the Game Commission, you know, mm-hmm. to, for enforcement purposes, to hire drones, like to mm-hmm. hire, you know, things to, to enforce that. I mean, that's because, I mean. I think the big thing is when we start talking about these kind of liberalizations, um, and, and that then in turn kind of sparking the, the acquisition of land at rapid rates to insulate from those liberalizations, you know, it, it circles back to the core of most hunters being disgruntled, which is access. Um, and so, you know, the, the number one issue that we're facing in, in almost any state is, is quality access for, for hunters. And these states applying these liberalized laws are forcing that act amongst, you know, other hunters to acquire land, which is killing access even further. Um, and what should be spent and what should be lobbied for and what should be, you know, focused on is acqu- the state acquiring more quality land for access and hunting. Yeah, but the state will never be able to compete with individuals, private Why interest. Why not? Because we have more money. Like, individuals will always have more money than the state's willing to pay. The state right now won't even... Um, you know, uh, Travis Weaver, the tax service, was just mm-hmm. telling me in Ohio there's a really nice 150-acre tract that the guy offered uh, to sell to the Game Commission. It's directly adjacent to mm-hmm. public land mm-hmm. for a reasonable price of like 5,000, 5,500 an acre, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take it. See, they, and, and that's because that's at the legislature level. Mm-hmm. They won't approve the purchase. Yeah, well, and that's because they, they want to pay 50% of the cost or whatever. They have to change that. That's a, that's a fatal flaw in, in every state, I think. Yeah. The, the big question for me, though, is be, becomes, why are you the guys fighting the battle? Yeah. Why aren't the guys that need the public access, why aren't they leading the charge? It's the guys that need it the least who are, are always the ones leading sure. the charge. Yeah. yeah. And I think it really boils down to personalities. I mean, you guys obviously are go-getters and you're going to be successful no matter what you do in life. And that's why you're able to afford land mm-hmm. because of your personality, your, your work ethic. And I think the people that we're trying to help and not to bash them in any way, and also not to ca- put them all in the same category, but a lot of them don't have the drive and the work ethic and the passion that, that you guys have. Sure. Well, <clears throat> let me put it this way, dude. I, you know, and I see some comments sometimes say that, you know, we, we Jeremy, and I bitch a lot or we complain a lot. <laughs> and like, and maybe that is true, you know, it, but it's, it's rooted in a passion for everybody having access to hunt high, you know, uh, mm-hmm. an older age class of bucks. I mean, that really is what's, that's what drives us mm-hmm. to, I mean, that's, that's where the sport is really at. It's, it's like, the man, evolution I, of a hunter. Like, I mean, we all, yeah, yeah. we all probably shot bucks, you know, years ago that are like, you know, I mean, I've killed button bucks, I've killed spikes, yeah. I've done, but I, I constantly am trying to evolve as a hunter 
and challenge myself and and mainly because I just enjoy hunting, yeah. right? If I and if you don't, fine. If you just want to hunt meat, you know, sure. great. But there should be an opportunity for people to hunt a healthy age class of bucks. Absolutely. And and the shame is that, you know, so Don, thank you for that compliment. You know, we are hardworking guys and and we have bought some land and like so over the years, you know, you're almost 40, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, 30, you know, Don, you're what? In your fi- late 50s? I just turned 60 Six. this summer. Happy birthday. And <laughs> Thank you. so between all of us, you know, I would say we've got good access to thousands, thousands of acres. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so you hear that in one breath, but then the reality is, and maybe you heard like on our intro before we even jumped on here, it's like, dude, everywhere you turn, I mean, we're just, de- just issues. And the number of mature bucks that are actually there to hunt, is just, it's, it's pretty depressing. Sure. And so if I step back and look at, okay, um, you know, Maybe guys who, who don't have the resources, who, who haven't put the time in, who haven't put the work in to like secure what we have, they surely have a, a worse experience on the access that they do have. So it's like, dude, just if if that paints a picture, it's like at a at a at a on a bigger scale, it's like, dude, we're all hurting for access here. Like, you know, mm-hmm. and and just the number of of mature bucks to hunting, they're just it's dwindling. And it's like, man, what are we gonna <laughs> what are we gonna do? Well, yeah, I mean, you either alter your expectations right yeah. or, and that's throughout some guys want to go well it's just not possible or people are going to continue to insulate mm-hmm. themselves from it mm-hmm. um and even that doesn't i mean case in point whether we just talked earlier about dogs or i had that side by side going through like trespassers it, like easily could ruin a farm anyways trespassers. doesn't doesn't well, matter if do, you have the pro- I'll property tell you what, or not cr- crossbows i do think are a, are a you know they they certainly have a major impact but in states i mean ohio is the one that's closest to our heart they're my my heart anyways there there are there are regulations like the baiting thing in ohio nullifies the ice the the insulation i know a lot of guys that own a thousand plus acres in ohio and all and a lot of them are like i don't have a deer to hunt because they're all getting they're getting baited so hard it it doesn't matter how much acreage you have it's the classic distribution of wealth we've talked about this yeah i mean that's what it is it's it doesn't matter if you have a thousand acres Corn is a distribution of wealth model that will let the guy with five acres next to you have the same chance of killing that deer. Yeah. That's what it is. Well, and the thing of it is the fewer mature bucks there are, the the more this is magnified because the guy finds, I I can't own 80 acres and and have a mature buck to hunt. I've got to own 500 to have a mature buck to hunt. I remember the day in Illinois where anything you had permission to hunt it could be five acres there was a mature buck using that five acres mm-hmm. at some point. He, was, he was within the range home range of a mature buck on every property well today that's not the case right today you absolutely have got to own i, I don't even think leasing is viable anymore in illinois um you, you just can't <clears throat> lease and manage strict enough yeah because because your goals and the landowner's goals are going to be totally different he's not going to allow you to put in 10, 20 acres of food plots or cut his timber or what needs to be done on a lease, you're going to have to own a larger track just to have a mature buck to hunt every mm-hmm. year. Yeah. And it just magnifies the problem. Yeah. Well, and it just seems like almost, it's just crazy that that's what has to happen. Cause it's like, yeah, land ownership is, is, is great. Like, mm-hmm. and I don't want to belittle that, but like, you know, we're passionate about killing big deer you know, and, and the land ownership is like, yeah, I, I want to own land. I want to have the ability to do that. But it's like, I don't want to have to buy, nor can I afford to buy what it takes to achieve what I really want. Well, yeah. I mean, nobody, nobody's, the three of us are not sitting here saying, well, yeah, you know what? We'd love to pay $8,000 an acre for this ground and own this ground to grow mature bucks. Like, we'd rather not have to pay anywhere close to that price to do that. Sure. Um, It, it just depends, like, if your life you know, from a passion, hobby, however you want to say it, standpoint revolves around deer hunting, right? You're, if you can afford it, you're going to pay it. That's what it comes down to. And there are a lot of people who like deer hunting, but they also like going to football games or to concerts or going out to eat every night of the week, whatever it is. And your money's go to those other things. So you can't afford this stuff. And And that's okay. Well, And dude, the reality though, is that opportunity could be maybe not as good, but it is there for those guys too. If it weren't for these liberalizations of the seasons, the resource would be that much more plentiful on all of the land that it, it wouldn't be an issue. Well, I don't think any of us are arguing that, the, you know, including the three of us, like our our drive and our demand for land is driving up prices on land. Sure. 
It, it inev inevitably because we we want to secure it because of these liberalizations. Yeah. And so that's where it's it's it, it is it is absolutely counterproductive to what it should be because those abilities to enhance hunting, right? That's what these liberalizations in their mind should be creating an enhanced hunting experience an enhanced opportunity at success is having a complete negative effect. We're walking towards a cliff that is going to drop off here and we're going to yeah. lose a lot of these people because who wants to hunt when you, you've got nowhere to go? You don't see any deer, right? Like that, that is a completely, you know, not, not fun experience that, any hunter, especially a new hunter, doesn't want to do. Yeah. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But, yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah. And I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H U N T R 2 0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code. Save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. Well, I'll, I'll take this whole conversation down another path. You know, the state game agencies are, are becoming less and less friendly to, to managing for mature deer. And I think the reason for that is CWD. CWD has been proven to be more prevalent in older age class deer and especially older age class bucks. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you get these agencies that have totally bought into the CWD hysteria and they don't, they, they're seeing these regulations like adding the crossbow in Illinois as being a great thing because they've taken the age structure of the deer herd and just crashed it. Those, yeah. those top, those older age class bucks are no longer there. And that plays right into their hand for their CWD management. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that turning around. I, I think that some of these agencies and have totally bought into that hysteria and I don't see them turning that around. No. The I, interesting thing. Go ahead, Don. Uh, go ahead. We, we can discuss. CWD well, no, first, I, I, I was going to say in fact. that same discussion with CWD, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of state agencies, you know, maybe off the record as much is, um, they don't believe, you know, obviously up until COVID, you know, at least we've had a decreasing number of hunters. They don't believe that the hunters as they stood prior to some of these bigger changes, um, could manage the deer herd. And, and I don't know if that's from a biological standpoint or to your point earlier, Don, from a lobbyist standpoint, when you talk about some of these insurance agencies and things like that, but, um, you know, and I've heard the topic even more so since we've started to bring it up and discuss is that basically people are, are using this, you know, whether it's a crossbow uh, crutch or an Ohio straight wall cartridges for rifles um, as well, you know, you guys couldn't efficiently manage the herd anyways. We have to do all these things to, that's the only way we're going to keep the herd in check. Uh, and I think that's just, you know, these are coming from fairly uneducated people, in my opinion, in terms of deer biology and management. Well, yeah, that makes no sense whatsoever because they, they can regulate the seasons. I mean, you could have a doe season year round and control the herd if you want to control yeah. the herd. Well, I don't, but, I don't know if it's the season that keeps people from shooting does. I think it's the, I think it's the, the post harvest, man. I think if the state could provide a resource that was like easy for me to go and drop off whole does, guys would bring them yeah. in by the truckload. That's, that's the, about the sole reason I don't shoot them is because I don't want to deal with it. That, that's a great point. I'm the same way. I mean, I know I need to shoot does on my farm. I do shoot some every year, but it's more of a job than it is a pleasure Yeah, yeah. Um, because of having to deal with it after you shoot it. Yep, and yeah. being ethical hunters, we're absolutely not going to be wasting our game. So yep. We're going to make sure that it's utilized somehow. 
And that's a great point. If there was a way to utilize this meat to feed the homeless or whatever and not cost the hunter anything, I think we, we could control the deer herd that way. But Absolutely. It, when it comes to the states managing the deer herd, there's, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. First of all, we tie our biologist hands with, by the politics. No uh, doubt. Our legislature, our, our, we, we need good biologists, and then we need to give them free reign to do yes. what they need to do. I agree. And uh, the other thing is that that herd needs to be managed for two things, age structure and sex ratios. Mm-hmm. And, and as well as population levels, you want to keep that population at a certain level, but within that population, you need good age structure and you need good sex ratios. And I think a lot of times to the biologist uh, credit, they want to do the right thing, but their hands have just been. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that's a big point. I think the other thing that that's interesting um, from a state level as well is, you know, it, Basically, the, the state is laying out simple guidelines, right? They're guardrails. If you look at the actual management, just like we're talking about now of, of, you know, basically gobbling up land from a recreational side, you know, think about the effects that the private landowner who cares about deer has on a deer herd versus the remaining balance of land in many of these states. And, and so essentially, like, Cool, Jared, you can go out, you can kill whatever, two bucks in Illinois and however many does you want. Well, it's up to you whether you do that or not on your property, just like it's up to Don, just like it's up to me. And so when they lay these guardrails out there, that's all well and good. But, you know, people on a private level are really the micro influencers on what's going to happen from a deer management standpoint. This landscape, you know, blanket that they throw over. I personally think has very, very little effect aside from some of these liberalizations uh, that are allowing for easier harvest to happen. Well, it just limits, you know, it's, it sets like a maximum of, you know, I bet if, you know, if I could have unlimited buck tags, like that, a, a, a number of guys would go out and continue to, to try to mm-hmm. kill bucks, you know. Sure. But that's because there's a motivator, for, you know, it's it, there's an incentive, like just an industry, like mm-hmm. a... Uh, you know, uh, notoriety, like w- whatever drives people to want to, you know, e- even just a, Hey, I just want to do, I'm just, I'm really driven to do this. You're going to continue to do that. And you're not going to, you know, I'm not going to shoot does. Like I have yeah. tags for does and it's just like, well, I just, I don't have that same. Well, men- that's why I've always been intrigued mentality. with a Ernabuck, like in Wisconsin. Sure. Like what if you had to shoot a doe or two to get your buck? Tag? I think those are well-respected programs. Like, because guys realize like, Hey, I, you know, I don't want to shoot a does, but I understand that, you know, this is a management practice that makes sense. So- I think it would protect a lot of bucks to older age classes. Cause think of, think of some of the people who are your weekend warrior type hunters if you make them shoot two does before they can shoot their buck, they're going to get bored with it or they're not going to put the effort in. It's just, but if they can go out and kill a big buck on the first day they hunt, they're going to keep going. They're going to keep hunting. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a lot of hunt, deer hunters that if there was no limit on bucks, they would shoot every buck they possibly could. Yep. And they would be the ones complaining the loudest that there's no big <laughs> bucks anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, not, not only that, Don, we, so we go, like, we use the extreme example, like, so if we look at whatever, baiting and crossbows is like examples of things that make hunting easier. It's like, you know, what about thermals? What about hunting them at night? You know what I mean? That's a pretty effective way to do it. Like, that's, boy, <laughs> you know, it sounds crazy, but if you were to open that up, there's there's guys that would do it. It's like, hey, I'll, uh, there's guys that are doing it now, oh, legally, yeah, but if you ever, sure. they'd be like, well, that's how we do it. That's the culture here. That's, you know, that's how I kill them. And mm-hmm. surely that will, you know, about exterminate any opportunity for having an age class, you know, ever. Yeah. You know, I've come down on hunters pretty hard on this podcast so far. And, <laughs> but, but really, you know, the reason that we have the, the mature bucks we do is because of hunters. Sure. Um, th- there is a lot of guys that are very similar to the three of us that are conservationists first and foremost mm-hmm. they're not just deer killers like like some there's a lot of really good conscientious conservationist deer hunters that want to do what's best for the deer herd so i, I don't want it to sound like i'm coming down on every hunter that don't own land or right. whatever sure. there's a lot of guys that don't own land who, who try to do the right thing with the deer herd they utilize the deer that they do shoot they they, they don't shoot more than what they think the herd uh, can stand so I, I just wanted to throw that in there. So yeah. everybody's listening to this podcast thinking this guy's got an elitist attitude 
because he owns land. No. Well, I, th- I think a, it shines light on the fact that we're all on the same page. Yeah, it's we, a limited resource. Everybody reason. wants to shoot a big buck. It's a we limited resource, though. There are only so many of them out there. And so, right. like, yeah, I mean, we, if everybody could shoot a five-year-old 150-plus-inch buck every year, awesome. Be great. But you know what? It's just they're they're not there. Um, well, and you know what, though? That—, that you know, that result is the effect of like all the things we're talking. There could be a lot more bigger bucks mm-hmm. fairly Absolutely. easily. Yes. Yeah. Like Absolutely. we, and it doesn't have to do with buying land or anything like that. We just have to make them harder to kill. Yeah. And th- there's an interesting conversation here. Maybe we circle back to is like, it's not, I think things like, especially the baiting, maybe you could make an argument for crossbows and probably cell cameras as well. Those things specifically target mid to up older age classes of bucks. You know, because pe- and and that's driven by an underlying motivator of pe- people want to shoot big bucks. So mm-hmm. if I can dump a corn pile and I can do all these things, and then I have the option of shooting a three or four year old buck or shooting some does, like I'm going to shoot the buck. Yeah. But if those are replaced with you know whatever a, a standard gun season, um, whatever they're they're reduced in a way, it's not going to affect the deer number harvest. It will just increase the age structure. I believe. Yeah. Well, the, the late, great Roger Roth, our legendary bow hunter from Ohio, of all places, mm-hmm. said years ago, he, he's a mentor of mine. I, I, was like, I met him when I was like 18, 19 years old and uh, actually included him in my second book. He, he wrote a few chapters in that. But uh, him and the Wenzels were pretty much responsible for the modern whitetail movement, if you will, mm-hmm. um, back in the early 80s, like yep. 70s, early 80s. But Roger said we could all shoot mature bucks if we all only shot mature bucks, and there is nothing more. That's about as pure as it gets, doesn't it? Yep. It's it's so weird that I think um, you you get into these conversations with someone, and there are some people, especially on like some of these public land groups. There's some guys that hunt so hard on public land and are successful at killing mature bucks. And man, I give them credit. I mean, cause it, it's not easy. I've done it in the past. And you know, one of the reasons I have land is cause it, it, it frankly, it is a little bit easier and my chances of having success at a mature buck, uh, you know, year in or year out, or at least I'm in the game, right? That's what I'm trying to be is in the game. Um, that said, what, what I've had conversations and some of these, these people, you know, probably in the last two months even, is a lot of the work I do. So so my Ohio property is actually bordered by public land. And so a lot of the work I'm doing, I'm doing timbering right now, I've planted food plots, um, is that same herd that I'm hunting on my property is the same herd that these guys on the public land next to me are hunting, right? And so it, the discussion had been, I ran into a couple of these guys, it's one of the it's kind of funny one of the guys understood very cleanly of like oh like what he's doing on private land is making our public hunting better because it's the same deer the other one completely looked at it like i'm trying to hoard the deer and it's like listen i've uh, i've well i've got over 200 acres there now those deer aren't staying on that farm right they're leaving they're crossing into public i've got cameras on public land i have the same deer over there but the guy who understood it, I thought was a kind of a cool breakthrough for both of us to say, like, listen, we're hunting the same deer. Like, you don't have the opportunity to do management activities on this public land. I do. And so if I can enhance the deer hunting for the entire area, that's all I want. I don't care if you end up shooting the deer and I don't. The fact that we grow, we could grow a mature buck and we were all having a chance to hunt them, that's, mm-hmm. that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's such a fine line because the other guy clearly was looking for, well, man, I don't care if I put a corn pile on your side of the fence and sit there with a crossbow and kill that deer. Like, that's, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to, I'm just here to kill a deer. And it's, it's those differences in discussion that I think are, um, are really what's, what's causing a lot of the divide and misunderstanding between, especially the private land and the public land guy, um, or the guy who's losing access because somebody bought it to it nobody's buying it to kick you off they're buying it because they want to create a better hunting situation for themselves which in turn if there's still opportunities around creates better hunting situations for you too well it comes down to mindset you know the two different individuals you just described i would venture to guess that uh, the individual that 
kind of sided with you and seen the benefits of your management, I, I would bet that uh, he he's more successful. Absolutely because is. Because of his, his positive attitude about things. Yeah. And it's just like you take the guy that works 60 hours a week um, and, and has a side job as well. You go to his house, and I guarantee you his yard's mowed that his yard's trimmed. Yep. He's probably got nice landscaping that he's him and his wife are doing themselves. Yep. You go to the guy that's unemployed. He he's sitting there in a the lap of house that the grass hadn't been mowed in a month and beer cans all over the yard and everything else. It's all a mindset. Yeah. And the successful people are going to be successful no matter what they're involved in. And they're going to look for the good in each situation instead of the bad. Now they'll, they'll, they'll notice the bad and they'll try to address the bad in situations. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what comes down to the most successful deer hunters are, are guys that have a positive attitude. Yeah. You, you know, they, they're looking to uh, change the, the bad or the negative in any way that they possibly can. If they can't, they'll accept it, make mm-hmm. the most of it, but it, it's all a mindset when it comes to killing big deer your attitude going in is either your biggest ally or or your biggest weakness. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. And and that's probably getting tougher, man. As we talk about this, you know, just increasing pressure. It's like, it's hard to maintain a positive mindset when you've got whatever abundant access and still very few deer to hunt, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, they do, it does pay off. Like, you know, you just killed a, a giant two days ago. So, I mean, it's not, none of us are sitting here saying like, Hey, there's no chance ever that we'll kill big box. I mean, it's, we've fought for what we have, mm-hmm. um, all of us. And, and it does pan out, but boy, it's, it's tough to maintain that positive attitude when it's like, you just have a constant bombardment of like yeah. of neighboring issues or of trespassing or of like new legislation getting passed. It's like, man, it's, it's an uphill battle for well, sure. I think that's the big piece of it is like, <clears throat> if you're, if you're in the game on a, on a big buck, on a mature buck and that buck gets killed by the neighbor or whatever, if, if everything is, is in check with the legality of the law, so be it. Like that's, that's just what happens, right? Well, to a point, I mean, a big part of our conversation is we're saying these laws are out of line. Right, right, right. But I, but I'm just saying, because there are things that are happening that are, that I think are, are pushing beyond, like obviously deer gets poached. That's, that's, I don't care what side of the line you stand on. No, no hunter should be okay with a deer getting well poached. see that's where we get the comments where it's like well hey as long as it's legal i'm fine with it it's like okay so if i make hunting deer with thermals legal like you're, you're cool with that and then it's like well you know i don't know but it's because <laughs> hunters aren't making these laws yeah right it's, yeah it's people who have no idea what hunting is they're just getting lobbied to by a group that they think yeah. is representing yeah. the yeah. hunting yeah world well that's why we're stepping back and saying hey we respect the laws and they're there for sure. a reason but also like let's look behind the cloak here and see how these things are getting passed Oh, hey, maybe none of our best interests are uh, in mind here. Maybe we should do something about this. Yeah. Well, and, and to kind of build on that idea, you know, the, the reason that the crossbows have been thrown into so many archery seasons in so many states, lobbyists, it's the archery industry. That, that's Absolutely. a big issue I have with the Archery Trade Association, the ATA. The, all they're about is selling gear. 100%. And, and these, these uh, manufacturers of crossbows have done a great job getting their crossbows in all these seasons. And what's that mean? That means they sell more crossbows. It's all a money game. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and these companies that should be representing hunters and conservation, all they're representing is their own pocketbook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, we're like, just like you said, Don, we're not anti-crossbow. I mean, my, kid, my kids shoot a crossbow. It's, it's awesome for them to be able to go out and hunt archery. Season we we describe me. it as a transitional weapon, yeah. you know, so, something that transitional a, a, in or transitional out. Yep. That's just how it is. Or disabled, like no issues with that in military, obviously short on time. But when you get to these other things, I think Don, you said it really well there of like, when you take a group of hunters who traditionally had seven to 10 days to hunt a year and you give them three and a half months without any other restrictions of boundaries there per like an earn buck, essentially, you automatically are going to have a massive negative impact on the deer herd and on the buck age structure. Mm-hmm. It's inevitable. Mm-hmm. You just took a giant amount of people and put them into a position where they can hunt longer well, with an efficient weapon. See, and that's where I, like, you know, if, if we have the ability to choose, which I, I don't know if you do, but it's like, I, I'm in favor of people having time to hunt. You know, I realize that time time mm-hmm. is a limiting factor. I don't think that should be the reason that people can't hunt. However, and like I thought what you said there was correct, is that has to be paired with uh, 
an increased difficulty. Like it can't be super sure. easy and you have all the time in the world Correct. to do it. You know, let's let's give people time to do it, but man, you got to be limited to a, a primitive weapon or even a Yeah, give me 5 months but tell me I can only use a longbow or a recurve. Can't okay. use your bait to do <laughs> like it, that, you know. You know, I mean, it, again, is is that hard? Is the challenge going to be way more difficult? Absolutely. But I mean, anybody who's passionate you got all about the time it in the world to do it will accept it. it. Yeah, they'll accept it and run with it. Uh, I'm going to stir up a little controversy here. Okay? We like you, you that. You know, um <laughs> Here's the thing about crossbows in, in archery season for able-bodied people. And again, I want to preface this with saying that I'm not against crossbows. Mm -hmm. I, I think that everybody should be able to hunt in the archery season. Mm -hmm. If you're able, um, you should be using a bow. Yeah. If, if age or a physical limitation does not allow you to shoot um, a compound or a recurve bow, then, you know, you should be able to use a, a crossbow. Yes. And when I get old enough that I can't shoot my bow, I'm, I'm going to go to a crossbow. I, I'm Absolutely. So against it. Yep. But here's the thing about a crossbow for an able-bodied guy, and I'm going to step on a lot of toes right here. This is the same mentality that has boys playing girls' sports. They, they can't win playing against their own. That's it. Um sex or whatever yeah their own group. peers yeah so so what do they do they got to change the rules so that they can be a winner where they don't even belong and and what the crossbow has done is basically brought the the gun hunters into the archery season it's not bow hunting at all no it, it's not and for an able-bodied guy you take a, a guy that's 25 30 40 years old whatever you know six foot two 220 pounds and you're telling me that he can't shoot a bow? Mm -hmm. Well, come on. I've been doing it my whole life, and I, I'm i not saying that, that I'm not healthy or anything, but there's a lot of people just looking for an excuse to, to make it easier. And that's oh. all it is. It, it's no different than a guy saying, okay, I can't win playing basketball with a 16-year-old, so I'm going to go play against a 12-year-old so I can dominate. That's exactly it. There's, there's no difference there. I've not heard, we've had plenty of arguments come back from the pro crossbow side. I've not heard a single argument though, come back to say that, um, that the reason that they use a crossbow is cause they have plenty of time, right? That the number one excuse that I hear is, well, I don't have time. Um, well, if you don't have time to be proficient at the weapon, then you shouldn't hunt. That's just what it comes down to. Well, you have an ethical well, responsibility. There's opportunity for that. I mean, that's gun season. Okay. It's gun season. The hunt, hunt with a gun during the gun season. Yeah, but I want to hunt more. Okay. Well, well grab a bow. Grab a bow. Make that, time. There's you that's have options exactly no matter what. 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 The, the the end argument that just never makes sense to me is the fact that there are plenty of people and we'll get a comment on it for this podcast for sure that believe that it is either easier or as easy this. to shoot a compound that it is a a crossbow and it, there's no way that's it's not even a close to valid it's not, it's not a valid argument it. yeah it's not a valid yeah. argument at all and the other thing with the lack of time is like it's bullshit dude make time like if it's important well to they you, don't care about it as much it, well okay, okay that's so, that that's yeah. what and they won't take make that time. as an if answer if something's important to you then make time for it i mean it's as simple as that yeah but i want to watch football i want to go to the concerts i want to eat out yeah. you just don't care about it as much yeah mm -hmm. And I, I, and I know that it hurts people's feelings and I don't care like it, at all, but it's just, well, for, it comes down to dude, the, the deer's life is more important than that. It, it is, you know I mean? You, yeah. you should be proficient at your weapon. I mean, it, it's just, and frankly, it's important to enough other people who are paying for licenses and stuff that like, um, yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. Don, what's your take? Cause I mean, the, the criticism we'll get here is like, well, okay, if you do that, people are going to quit and we're going to have less hunters. Do you, do you think that hunting is threatened, uh, if we lose hunters here? No, absolutely not. Hunters are already a very minority of the population anyway. If that minority gets half as big, we're still a minority. Yeah. We, we've got no political clout as a group, you know, when it comes to major issues. That, that's just a cop out. That's again something that the, the archery industry or the hunting industry has thrown out there. We got to recruit more. You know why they want to recruit more hunters? So they can sell more gear. Yeah, more dollars. Wow. It's a dollar game. Yeah. They don't care about conservation. You know, there's some good groups out there, you know, like the Pope and Young Club and Boone and Crockett that, that are pro-conservation. But if you look at the numbers of 
people that are belong to those organizations be, be compared to some of these others. Yeah. It's minuscule. Minuscule. Yeah. I, I don't care. I'm never going to recruit a hunter. Now, if a young hunter comes to me and wants advice or help with something, I absolutely will help them all I can, give them all the advice I can, but I'm not going to show up at school and try to recruit a bunch of kids to be become hunters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's either in your blood or it's not. And, and it's all about the dollar. The dollar is the biggest problem in this whole industry. Yeah. I, I mean, from one, from, we could go down a hundred different rabbit trails here uh, about the problems in the, the hunting industry, the hunting community, however you want to look at it. And it all comes down to dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, there have been a few people that have pointed it out, and I absolutely agree with them that um, you know, in tandem with liberalization uh, of of some of these laws, crossbows, baiting, season links, different caliber rifles, whatever, the industry has been the foundation to support that liberalization the whole way, in my opinion, um, because absolutely. of the dollar. The, the, if you go back into the 90s and stuff, well, we talked about it before. You know, I remember watching TNN and Realtree and Buckman. There, there were very few things happening from a marketing side in, in hunting in the industry in a, in a dollar sign. Sure, there were products that were being sold, and there, there always have been gimmicks along the way. But if you look like in the last 10 to 12 years especially, the way that the hunting industry has, has basically ballooned itself – into products and gimmicks and you need this and you need that type of thing it has been the foundation to support the liberalization of these seasons through lobbying uh, mostly uh and and that in its in itself has what has turned this thing into what people now call well hunting's a rich man sport yeah it's because it's not necessarily the individual man the individual rich man it's the lobbyist and the manufacturers that have pushed hunting to be a rich man sport on behalf of the industry you're saying absolutely like, on, the, on behalf of like the on, dollar like on what issues like what do you think they just want to sell more product they want to make more money and so they do that via lobbying yeah well there's a difference i think between you know you can throw the baby out with the bath, bath water i think the industry certainly is responsible for like the motivation behind killing giant bucks it certainly absolutely has, you know i think giant bucks are at an all-time premium you know because of the industry because of our pocket because mm -hmm. we talked about how cool it is you know mm -hmm. all of this which i don't think is inherently you know a bad thing it's, it certainly brings attention and that's it's one thing but you're talking about specific company like we've talked about raven crossbows literally you know using lobbying. marketing budget to hiring lobbyists to pass these things that uh, I make think, hunting worse for everybody but i think it's also just there's there's a lot of industry stuff that you know, it is constantly pushed onto the hunters, onto new hunters, especially, or, or you know, uh, let's say, you know, in, inexperienced hunters to say, you need this, you have to do this, you have to buy this. It, it's just constantly, I mean, yeah. it's what social media does. I mean, look at what you scroll down, you know, all the time. Yeah, dude, the whole R3 movement is kind of bizarre. Like, dude, I, I never once experienced a piece of, like, pr marketing material. Because it was in your blood. That got me interested in hunting. Like, dude, I hunting's cool as shit like that's it's pretty much the best thing i can think of like there's nothing that needs me to get me excited about it or like to keep me interested the only thing that's going to disinterest me is when the experience is so bad that i'm like man does this thing even exist anymore like is, it's can that, we that in the root is the complaint we have with r3 is that the retention uh for us as hunters gets zero attention and all of it gets put on the recruitment, which in effectively makes us, the retained hunters, less interested or less engaged because our experience is worse. Yeah. It's kind of the best case scenario. Like, you don't need a budget for hunter retention. You just need to get rid of some of these things that are destroying it. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, that's why I asked well, that question, Don, because people, people truly believe that if we do not continue to recruit new hunters, that hunting is dead. They believe it, and I don't how, at all. How is it? How is either. it? How is it possible? Per what you just said there, and Don, what you said, we're already an extreme minority. That like, it, it seems it, it maybe it's just my perception, but it sure seems like a reality. Is like every single property that can be hunted in the United States is being hunted by one or more guys. <laughs> Every we single property. Runners. How is it <laughs> possible? And yet we're a minority. It's like we're everywhere. I don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. You, you know, we're already having trouble finding places for the hunters we got to hunt. Yeah. The last thing we need to do is increase our numbers by 25%. Yeah, that's it. And, and that's just going to make it even worse. Yeah. I, I don't think people realize, um, it, like, it, it's just like the mature buck thing. Like, land is a very finite resource. 
Uh, and there's only so many people you can stuff into a piece of ground, especially if you want to make, you know, high quality hunting experiences and expectations. And so when you look at the scale of these things and you look at what people are doing, again, the people wanting to recruit hunters are either, uh, uninformed because they just think, well, I don't want hunting to die. So I need new, I need new hunters or they're trying to make money off of it. Whether that's legislatures, state game agencies, manufacturers, doesn't matter. Trying to make money off of new hunters coming in, right? The only people who are saying that we don't need more hunters are the people who actually care about the limited resource in Absolutely. conservation. And, 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 and it makes and it sound And there's terrible, people in between right? that don't know. They're just like, yeah, that sounds good. Like we Well, won't. they're uninformed. Right, right. Yeah, right. they're uninformed. They, they believe they're in favor of recruiting new hunters because they don't want to lose hunting, but they're just uninformed that hunting's not going to go anywhere if, you know, 25% of the hunters drop off the face of the earth tomorrow. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. It's no, no worse than where we're at right now. Um, it's, in getting, fact, it's, be, it's, get, it's getting worse every day. I mean, dude, land is a limited resource. You literally, they're not making any more. There is a, there's a speci specified amount of land. That's what it is. Yep. There's not going to be any more and or it's less. It's decreasing the, rapidly. The deer herd is, it doesn't have to be a, I mean, it is a limited resource. Like, uh, technically speaking, but like it's one that can be greatly influenced. Like in a mm -hmm. relatively short period of time, we could have way more or way less or way better or way worse deer. Like we can make those decisions. I mean, Where on the flip side, we're not making any more land. It's we're right. losing, we're losing deer that's habitat right. so I, rapidly. I think at this it's point. silly to like, if you know, whoever a state or an organization is going to put effort into or money into more access when you have opportunities to stop bleeding on terms of the, the actual deer resource and human resource mm -hmm. that's being applied to that, that one can be fairly easily fixed via legislation and enforcement. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, this goes back to the situation in Ohio where, you know, the group that you guys are involved with is trying to change things. The, the better you make Ohio, the more pressure is going to be on that resource. And Absolutely. It, as part of that effort, Ohio, they better they better take a lesson from Illinois and Iowa. Mm -hmm. I remember the day when Illinois was way better than Iowa in terms of, of giant bucks, way better than Iowa. We <laughs> blew Iowa away. But the thing that Iowa did that Illinois did not, Illinois just became very liberal with their non-residents. Yep. And they let everybody in the country come hunt, come buy land, get free landowner tags. Iowa, on the other hand, very limited number of tags to begin with, and you cannot buy land in Iowa and automatically get a landowner tag. Exactly. You're still on the drawing of everybody else. Yep. Yeah. Ohio, you know, ironically, a few years ago, Illinois could have got back on top with just two or three regulation changes. Now it's going to take a whole list of changes. And that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So Ohio is in a position that Illinois was in a few years ago and that it's not going to take much for Ohio in my opinion, to be better than Iowa. Agree. I think it's got that much potential. What are they? Because what, they're already doing. What What are they, Donald? Well, already. The good thing that they've already got going is they got a one buck limit, yep. and, and they've got a gun season that happens after the rut. Those two things are huge. Well, so, uh, uh, know, the youth season is during the rut. It's like the seventeenth, nineteenth. But how many days is it? I'm not sure if it's only that weekend or if it continues on to the. Uh, the normal gun season right after Thanksgiving or not. So even the youth during that, uh, during the peak rut is, is not huge, especially if you get rid of the, the bait piles, the bait well, piles, is the bait piles yeah, that's where you're going. But my personal experience, that's when we lose them youth season. And it's probably you're losing them on bait piles. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So the guy's sitting out there with a gun, he, dad's probably in the in the blind and the, the kid's probably sitting there playing on a video game waiting on dad to tell him okay here's a deer get up and shoot it yeah. you know and the, yeah the gun's sitting there on a lead sled or whatever and, mm -hmm. and the yeah kid exactly pulls the trigger and goes back to playing his video game that's what happens during a lot of these youth hunts 100 percent. but uh ohio if they don't tie in some non-resident limitations mm -hmm. right out of the gate and stick with them then what they're going to do is they're going to have a much better deer herd, but they're going to have non-residents like me coming in and buying up a bunch of ground and the residents are going to get pushed away. Mm.
The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. We got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Yeah, the non-resident thing is interesting and, and funny. I, so I am a non-resident of Ohio currently. If that changed, I, I might move. But um, yeah. I'd hope my landowner status would keep me keep me tag. So in the tags. I don't personally deal with a lot of like leasing and any any more for for just the dynamic is such that like uh, most of my neighboring properties are getting hunted by uh, the people that own them or immediate family members or in some cases there's permission and stuff, but. I do know there's some parts of Ohio that are, you know, riddled with leasing, you know, and actually, dude, Travis was telling me the other day, I was just checking with him. I was like, what do you, what do you see in like 25 bucks an acre still for leasing? He's like, I've seen some go for 50 or 75, like uh, closer were, to Dayton. And there uh, was one in Columbus or right outside of Columbus. And I saw one actually in Illinois, uh, 95 an acre. Um, yeah. 95 bucks an acre. So that's, yeah, that's, a, that's another, that's an issue that, you know. I'm also seeing, at least in my area uh, of Southern Ohio, I've got an outfitter really close to me. Um, he's, he told me the other day, he's up to 4,000 acres leased. And he just, he just goes to the landowner. And if somebody's currently leasing it, he just gives them 10 bucks an acre more. Doesn't care what the price is. Just, just to acquire. It's almost the, the interest rate thing. It's like, well, if I don't get this under my belt now, I might not get it next year. I might not be able to afford it two years from now. So I might as well just pay whatever and get it locked down. Yeah. Well, the thing that the Ohio group needs to do, and, and you know, I, I've, I'm not going to get involved with that group, but I'll be glad to offer some advice based on my experience with Illinois, is you need to put together a comprehensive approach that addresses a handful of issues. And, and it also needs to put more money in the coffers of Ohio, the state of Ohio. Sure. And you could do that. I mean, the, the non-resident deer tag fee in Ohio is ridiculously cheap. Yeah, it was a hundred, so, hundred and some bucks. Yeah, which is you come. They, re, they recently in two hundred bucks, something like that. Yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, it's so seventy six bucks per tag plus like two or three hundred or something. Yeah. Yeah. So so you could put together a comprehensive package deal that increases the revenue for the state of Ohio while at the same time addressing the quality of the deer herd. And here we are, we're three non-residents mm -hmm. working, working to improve the hunting in Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's going to cost us if they raise the non-resident tag, it's going to cost the three of us more money. Yep. But yep. we care enough about the resource. We're willing to pay more money to hunt a better resource. But the thing they got to remember is that there's 200,000 more guys just like us that have never hunted Ohio, that as soon as Ohio becomes really good, they're we're coming. converging there. Yeah. 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 I would be in favor. We, we talk about this a lot in terms of the resident side. And I've heard people, especially when you get into the meat hunter type of thing, you know, I, I would pay more as a non-resident to have more favorable license fees and stuff for residents. Like, I'd, I'd make it dirt cheap for those they guys to hunt them. Yeah, it is. I've, you you still, no, land, people still complain. They're too expensive. Landowners in Ohio don't need to buy a tag. It's free. Yeah. Just go hunt. <laughs> yeah, but um, just in terms of uh, residents. Over a certain amount of acreage. Yeah, I forget what it is, 40 acres or something. Is that what it is? Yeah. But yeah, it and just their kids. the And their kids. Yeah, it's already dirt cheap to hunt in Ohio. Still get people complaining. About what? <laughs> About the price. It's free. <laughs> well, if not, if you don't own land. Well, yeah. Yeah, right. So. You, I, I don't know what it is. Well, yeah, I've always bought a non-resident tax. I don't know mm -hmm. what a... I mean, in well, Pennsylvania, it's like 80 bucks for all the tags I have as a resident. Yeah, it's dirt cheap. They, they hold a draw like they do in Iowa where you got to buy your preference point. 
Yeah. Hmm. See, you know, th- there's there's ways they can make a lot of money. See, I'm conflicted. On the table. I'm conflicted with the, you know, and just transparently as a non-resident, like I, I want opportunities to go out of state and hunt because I mm-hmm. just the hunting here is not great. Mm-hmm. So that f- for me, and I just stated where I, my stance is at, you know, because because of my specific situation is, I feel like there's you know buckets that are way easier to like you know, to, to correct mm-hmm. that would greatly, you know, before you get to that point, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? It's like, instead of cutting people off, why don't we do things that improve the herd Well, resource? I think it, I think it's one and the same. Like if, if you took baiting away or crossbows away, whatever, or rifles away again in Ohio, you would automatically decrease the number of people hunting in that state in the overnight. Sh- in the short term. Yeah, in the long term, I think it comes back up because your age quality is greatly improved. Sure. And there's a lot more places to hunt now. Yep, absolutely does. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's just you're, you're high-grading your hunters. You're high-grading from people who are just dumping corn piles and, hunting, mm-hmm. you know, hunting with crossbows on small acreage to now you have a much better herd resource and people start to come back in because the interest for that high-age structure is still there, you know, and then— yeah, but are they conservationists? Are they guys who care about the resource? Or is it guys who are fl- fleeing Michigan where they're killing two-and-a-half-year-olds to kill four-and-a-half-year-olds? Well, year that's olds. what's happening in, like, Iowa. You know, that's why it takes six years to draw is we're all fleeing our <laughs> states that suck. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. Yeah, so it helps. It, it helps. One helps the other. You know I mean? Mm-hmm. If, if Michigan didn't screw up its own, or I'm sorry, if uh, Minnesota didn't screw up its own state, it mm-hmm. wouldn't drive all of its hunters to Iowa. It's it, it, uh, that, uh, Not to circle back on it, but it, just thinking about this discussion, and you know, I know there's a lot of Wisconsin guys probably listening to this that hate earn a buck, but man, that would just shake things up. I'd be all for that. If you would make people shoot a doe or two in order to earn their buck tag, in terms of keeping that buck to doe ratio balance, um, basically a lot of bucks would have to get passed, you know, and again, they it comes be, down to enforcement. They should be free too. I mean, dude, in Ohio, you bought, you have to buy a non-resident oh, yeah, license 76 bucks. and then a $76 per either sex tag. So like most For me guys, on my own land in Ohio. You want me to pay $76 to shoot a doe? Like you should be paying me. Pennsylvania doesn't have a <laughs> reciprocal tag with Ohio for their landowners. Yeah. So me owning land in Ohio, I don't get landowner tags. I have to buy non-resident tags to hunt my own yeah. land. Yeah. So if I want to shoot a doe, yeah, every doe there. I shoot costs me $76. Mm-hmm. And you can only shoot, it's a six deer state and there's two or three deer counties and stuff. Some are four, but here's the problem with the earn a buck in, in a state like Illinois, where you got uh, online check-in. Yep. Well, what's a guy do? He, he checks in. He didn't even shoot a doe. But yeah. He checks in that's a, a great point. And uh, the the honest guy is the one that's penalized every time. And even in states where you have a physical check in station where you got to check your dough in, mm-hmm. well, there, there's no road kills anymore. Every <laughs> fresh road kill gets picked up and thrown to the back of the truck and tagged. That's funny. And checked yeah. in, and then it gets thrown back in a ditch somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, the thing of it is, I, I, I've noticed in my entire lifetime of you know involvement in the hunting world, is that most well-intentioned regulations have a bigger impact on the honest guy than they do the, the honest yeah, guy. Yeah, sure. Well, you're going to have that. I mean, there's going to be an element of lawlessness. Of- oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, if baiting got banned, we would not bait. It's, it's legal. Right. But there would be a vast majority of people who say, screw the law. Absolutely. We'll bait. Yep. We, we found that out when we were talking about um, hunter education and hunting license. I was blown away the number of people that commented and said, I don't need a damn hunting license. Mm-hmm. That That's just another <laughs> government regulation on me. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what? Yeah. But that's how people Those are the feel. People that won't ever amount to anything in life, too. <laughs> <laughs> right back to what I said before. Yeah. People that are positive, people that follow the law, people that are involved, like yeah, the three of us, the, the, we're going to be successful no matter what we do, no matter what hurdles the government throws in front of us, we're going to be successful. And, and other people with a negative attitude, it doesn't matter what they do. They're, yep. they're just going to be average. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to oh, get people to um it's hard to get people to care about something that they're not vested in. Um and and that's what uh, I and I give a lot of credit to a bunch of the public land guys who man they scout hard, you know, guys like Steve Shirk and Johnny, like those guys hunt hard, they they scout hard, they care about the resource even though they have zero effect on the decision making of what happens on the properties they're hunting because it's all public, right? 
Um, I give a lot of credit to those guys. But then there's this whole group that literally is just there to abuse the resource. Like they just think it's there for them to kill, basically. They're they're givers and takers. That's it. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. And they they don't want to give anything and they want to take everything. Mm-hmm. That's just how it comes down. And I'm sure they do it in other aspects of life, right? It's not just hunting. Oh, yeah. Um yep. but it's a weird it's a weird decision because it's you cannot have a conversation with these people about it. You can't. Or it's going the to. same people or, that go to Walmart and they leave their shopping cart out in the, <laughs> of the parking lot so it blows into somebody else's vehicle. Yeah. You know, that, that there's a, a cart corral 10 feet away, mm-hmm. but that's just asking too much. Same same mentality. Yeah. yeah, it's tough to, you know, it's one of those things that um, I guess the more conversations I have with those kinds of people, the more I just, uh, I, you know, I don't say my piece like I used to because they're just not going to get it. It's a, it's inevitable. They won't understand how much I care about it, and that's okay. Um, but you, at the same time, when they complain, I just don't listen to them because you're not doing anything to help yourself. Amen. Amen, bro. <laughs> uh, this YouTube live we're going to do will be interesting. Yeah. I assume it'll be like, I don't know. I don't know. I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll, well see. Well, it, and again, there, obviously. We're, we're going talk- live on YouTube uh, on after, right after this, when this podcast airs. For the first time ever. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not to be negative about kind of the, the whole goal. It, listen, anybody that's listening to this, even if you're, you know, you get one week of vacation and you use three days of it for hunting a year, whatever. If you're listening to this, you have some passion about whitetail deer and whitetail deer hunting. That's that's why you're listening to this. You stumbled upon it. You, you're listening to this podcast. The goal here is to make sure that you can continue to enjoy that passion for the rest of your life. And then your kids can, and then your grandkids can. That's why we're having this discussion. It's not of greed for us to be able to kill a mature buck every year. Would we love to? Absolutely. But that's not why we're having the discussion. The discussion is being had because there is a a glimpse of fear that people in this country will not be able to enjoy hunting like I did growing up. Will I still be able to enjoy hunting? Absolutely. Because I'll not, do anything I need to to be able to enjoy It's not that just hunting. a glimpse of fear, dude. I mean, I, I, the three of us sitting here are saying, hey, there's a there's a big issue and we're all experiencing it right now. And the, and it's the conversation is motivated or driven by, you know, frustration because it, it could be a simple fix. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, it's like, man, we we just need to make a few changes, and like some of these states would would be corrected, and and yeah, ultimately we would like to kill big bucks. I would like for everybody that wants to to have the opportunity. I mean, I think that is a that's a that's a realistic goal. Yeah, everybody to be in the game, not necessarily. I mean, if everybody killed mature bucks, then it wouldn't be cool to just kill. Mature and that doesn't bucks, inf- right? affect in any way people that just 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 hunt for meat. There's more than enough enough meat, you know, deer with meat on them running around out there. There's yes. plenty of them, you know what yes. I mean? And you should be able to, you know, hunt your age class of bucks and stuff. But, you know, everybody should have the right to have the opportunity to share the resource in a way that, that they want to. And and it's more than possible. We just have to, like, well address some of these things. There are forces at work behind closed doors that are, that is ruining it. So even if we talk to other hunters and say, hey, listen, this is why we're doing this. It's not us. It's the the actual lobbyists yeah. and legislatures behind closed doors that are that are ruining this thing. Um, and I don't know up to the point of why these organizations are starting to pop up and exist. Is I don't know if us as a hunter's voice will do anything. Like, oh, cool. Call. We've talked about it before. Call up your local legislator. Tell them you don't want this bill passed. They don't give a shit. So, they don't care. So if it, so if it doesn't... It's a waste of time. It's so, a waste of time. So if it doesn't, the result is, you know, rich guys buy up all the property and they're the only ones that hunt. It's the European hunting that, model. That is that the point. long-term, uh, you know, that's what happens we, with that. We are, we are as close to the European model of hunting as we've ever been in this, this country. Yeah. Like, just really, really close to where... You will not be able to hunt uh, unless you have private land. Or the, the experience that you do have will just be absolutely miserable because there'll be 95 guys, you know, on a one square mile of public land. So stupid, man. Think about, uh, I, listen, I'm not for, you know, I've gotten speeding tickets that the cop <laughs> didn't pull me over and stuff. And I'm not for tickets. I'm not for, you know, government over, oversight necessarily. But for issues like baiting, you know, and... You know, you try to figure out, uh, man, how do we bring more revenue into the state mm-hmm. and also fix an issue? It's like, dude, what if you could, you know, 
flesh this out for me real quick. Just amuse me in listening to this. What if, what if you can hire enough money to pay for a lobbyist to change mm-hmm. the law? Now you can't bait in Ohio anymore. Mm-hmm. The remainder of those monies that keeps coming into that organization, you give it to the ODNR or the you know Game and Fish mm-hmm. for Ohio to hire drones to throw up, you know, just fly drones. And if you got corn piles on your property, you get a you get a ticket in the mail. Mm-hmm. You know, pretty pretty simple. It, uh, the one thing I will say on kind of the the way that those are set up from a like a DNR standpoint uh, in terms of, hey, you know, here's where the lobbyists are trying to push money and stuff. I, I think that it's, um, I think most hunters, 90% of hunters are naive to how this works, right? Mm-hmm. Which is why, again, going back, they, they complain to the, the DNR, the Game Commission. Oh, we're learning new stuff every day. Yeah, yeah and, it, talk and to they don't have any any direct pull on that stuff. But let's say you, you took away um, baiting, for instance. There would be a lot of people right out of the gate, no different than um, 2002 or 2001 when Pennsylvania put antler restrictions in place. There would be a lot of people right out of the gate say, forget it, I'm not doing it, or I'm going to quit hunting, or whatever it is, right? We are in uh, a position in this state uh, because of that that we've, we've got the best deer hunting we've probably ever had. Now, people still complain and say, well, it's not like it used to be. We don't have the deer camp. or it, The herd itself is the best that's been in the state in ever, ever. And so those short-term losses that people are going to face are for the better long-term. And what I don't know, though, because we are such a short-sighted society anymore, is if people can look past that. It's, it's the greed and the short-sightedness in, in everything in this country that is going to present an issue to realize that in the long term, and that may only be five years, it's not that long, it will be better. And I just don't know if, if society can handle that. Mm. Well, it's difficult to change culture. And the, the baiting culture in Ohio is, you know, well-rooted. Very. I, I literally, I, I think it will literally take a decade yeah. If that law was passed, it'll take a decade for it to really take effect. Yeah. Mm. You know, one I thing mean, that we, we didn't mention on that, just because we did some fact uh, checking on that, we've talked to plenty of farmers who have basically said it will not affect their business. Because that's the one thing that people say, well, you're going to put all these farmers out of business. Yeah, it's such a small percentage. It's a small percentage to where they're selling yeah. their grain to. Yeah. That argument holds no water whatsoever. But Yeah. It, it, it's going to take a while. I, I mean, I think right out of the gate, you'll probably cut it in half. And that would make a huge I, impact, I mean, yeah, right? Dude, yeah. half would be huge. If half the people followed the law and said, okay, no more bait, it would, it would immediately, the next season would be unreal in Ohio. Yeah. The, the, the second 50% is going to be the tough. It'll take one year to convert the first 50 percent yep. to no baiting then nine years a decade <laughs> yeah. to, to do the others well and this is probably the one thing that private landowners who care about conservation and all of the guys who hunt public land in ohio should be on the same page about right because they can't bait yeah. all those guys on well, public land can't bait well legally it, i i may <laughs> you know i'm not like a tattletale by nature and i'm not i'm not for you know we saw it in COVID, like the people telling on their neighbors and stuff but so, but, and, but dude, I put, I invest too much money into buying properties and, and, uh, improving our, our property mm-hmm. and stuff to allow for the neighbor to continue to, to break the law, frankly. Mm-hmm. So dude, I spent half my time throwing a drone up and get, you know, I'll do whatever it takes to like, yeah. to put a stop to it. Hmm. Here's another suggestion. When that law is written, anyone who's ticketed for baiting automatically loses their hunting privileges for a year Should. on the first offense. Sure. There you and go. The second offense, it's three years. The third offense, it's life. Yeah. And yeah, that that will speed things up a little bit. I Nobody think the to lose I think the right. slap on the wrist for these wildlife violations has got to be enhanced across the board on a lot oh, of different things. Yeah. It it's getting ridiculous. I mean, these people don't learn. I mean, we had people down where I was at in Ohio poach like fifty seven bucks over a two year period, and I know those guys are still hunting. I see them. They don't care. <laughs> Who's, who's telling them that they can't? Who's st- who's seeing them go out hunting and say, hey, sorry, you can't hunt? Nobody. There's no enforcement. There's no there's no yeah. influence on that. Um, well, society doesn't take game law violations Not serious. at all. This, especially you get the state's attorneys or district attorneys or whatever who has to prosecute these cases. They'll plea bargain them down or throw them out yep. one or the other. And uh, the violator basically gets away with nothing. That's it. 
Yeah, it's it's there are no examples. It, and honestly, that's across the judicial system, I think, anymore, is nobody's being made an example. So people continue to break the same law over and over again. That's exactly right. And it is a tough one. To, I mean, you have to literally see them, you know, in the instance of baiting, you know, doing that. Just You can't just find somebody because there's bait. Well, that you're sh- never, never going to you know? eliminate it completely. I mean, in a state of Pennsylvania where baiting has never been legal, there's plenty of deer I kill on a mountain where there's not a cornfield around that have a belly full of corn, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, people will break the law just because they're, they're garbage in life anyways, mm-hmm. right? Again, it doesn't just stay in hunting, right? If they break the law in hunting, that's because they do something in normal life that makes them a waste of life. That's just how it is, Yeah, you know? People will always be lazy. Try to cut corners. Hmm. What we're seeing in the hunting industry is just a reflection of what we're seeing in society in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, everything's become liberal. Everybody gets a trophy. Yeah. Um, nobody can get offended. You know, I, we we can't offend the guy that's using a crossbow. So we got to you know walk on eggshells, and everything's good. Every, everything's fine. Yeah. Whatever they want to do, it's just <laughs> yeah across the board yeah it's everything anymore yeah i i do think that um you know and maybe maybe it is i mean what the the participation trophy generations have been going on for quite a while now and now they're getting into a position where you know they expect that they can just do these things you know and just they should be rewarded for them i mean how many new hunters probably who don't come from a hunting family do you talk to and like they expect to kill a deer like if they don't kill a deer in a season, like I don't know if I should do this anymore. Like that is how their mentality is. Whereas, well, they should. It's pretty easy. Yeah, I, I mean, mean with, with the regulations that are in place, it's not hard to go kill a deer. Like, no, it's yeah, not. you should expect to kill a deer. Yeah, but that's not hunting. No, it's not. I agree with you there. And that's that's where that's I think killing. the legislators who are uninformed around hunting are also on the same board of like, well, yeah, everybody should kill a deer if you stop and think about it it's kind of amazing like in these these states where you have some of these like you know the, the prime example is in ohio where i can mm-hmm. put a cell camera over a corn pile sit 100 yards away with it during a yeah. gun season you know and, with the youth. Yeah. and it's like these 12 year old kids are shooting like four-year-old bucks it's like don't get me wrong i'm happy for the kid but like that's not right yeah that's not it's that's it's one of my biggest fears as a father bringing a seven and 11 year old into hunting more and more is that, you know, I put, I do a lot of work to where there's a good chance they could kill a four or five year old. You know, I was 30 by the time I killed a four or five year old deer, you know, it just, I, I worry that. And so for that reason, like they've had some success, they both killed, uh, multiple one year olds. Uh, my youngest killed a two year old this year. I'm now making it harder for them. We're sitting, we're not in box blinds. We're sitting in tree stands, right? They're both next year, there will be no crossbow. They'll, bo- they'll both be shooting compounds, mm-hmm. you know? And if they're not ready to shoot the compound, then they just won't, they won't go out with the compound, mm-hmm. right? That's just how it's going to be. But we're, the, the level of challenge will go up. They've seen some success. They've had the taste of success. I think if I kept going down that path, they would lose interest. Yeah. They, they don't want to do it. In fact, my oldest doesn't really. He's just like, eh. I'll hunt at some point. I'm just, I don't want to go right now. And you'll have that regard. Yeah. Regardless. But sure. But I mean, if you keep making it easier. Yeah. It's a transitional weapon. I mean, I think that's, that's a good move. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting take around that. And that's why, yeah, I'm for new hunters being able to use, use that and be able to have the advantages that go Not just out. new hunters, young hunters mm-hmm. in, in eh, physically incapable. I, I, I would be, if there had to be a compromise, I would absolutely be in favor of brand new hunters having the ability to use a crossbow for a year. So just first year license holders. Yep. Yeah. Why not? I mean, if, if that's what it took to get them in to, to have a chance to hunt more, to be in the woods more, to be familiar with it. Sure. If they're an 18 year old who's never hunted before. Yeah. Why not? Sure. That would be my compromise. Yeah. I can see that. I don't know how you enforce it. That's pretty. uh, Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just comes down to all game laws, but it it would be worth them having the ability to try. Maybe they don't have a lot of time on, but then once that happens, like once that year is passed, that's your transitions over. Now you've got during that year, you should have been practicing a compound being getting ready for next year. Or you just hunt gun season. I mean, it's really not that hard, dude. Just like go to a bow shop, you know, practice for. It doesn't take that long to get fairly proficient, like proficient enough with a bow. Like just shoot twenty yards and in. A few months in advance, you should have your bow. You know, you should practice a few times, a few times a week. You know, and it's, it's like 
it's way harder than a crossbow. Like I'm not gonna lie, but that's it's not it's not impossible. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so don't well, we're we're gonna let you slip here for a second, but. I think uh, because this is dropping on Halloween, um, a, a couple words of wisdom for you. So, um, number one, you were able to to get an arrow and babe here this week, uh, and and close a an amazing chapter, probably on a on a buck that I think, per your words, you don't know if you'll ever have as much history with a deer as you did with that one. Yeah, I've, I knew him really well. Put it that way. I've been watching him since he was at least three and a half. I just need to go back through some old video footage and, and such, see if I had him as a two and a half. But uh, I kind of threw that whole journey out on the Whitetail Master Academy uh, website. Um, I, we had a video category called Chasing 200. And uh, Babe had a chance, I, I thought, to maybe hit 200. Uh, last year he scored in the mid-180s. He actually lost a few inches from last year. Um, he had the start of some sticker points on his G2s and G3s that uh, I thought would get longer. But we just had a poor start to the antler growth season here in the Midwest this year. And so he lost a few inches. But uh, so I, I video documented everything that I, I did in a chase for that deer and uh, with my cell phone, basically. And then I would post them right after I recorded on, on that Chasing 200 series. And, Ended up uh, bringing it all together a couple days ago and, and put an arrow in Babe and and was able to harvest him. So uh, I, I named him Babe after Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth called his shot, you know, his home run there in the World Series back in whatever year it was, 1914, I think. But uh, so I, I named him after Babe Ruth calling the shot. And I, I typically don't put that much pressure on myself. And there wasn't a lot of pressure, but... After calling the shot, I figured I better put an arrow in him. Yeah. And uh, I, I did stay off of my property. We, we have a youth season here in Illinois, like the first weekend in October, and I've got two grandsons that hunted that. And I stayed off of the property until after that youth season. I think I would have killed him before that youth season because I ended up having him on, on camera three evenings in a row at the same spot. Um, where I actually ended up killing him um, well before dark, you know, well within shooting hours. And I think I would have probably shot him one of those three days. But uh, anyway, I got it done and, uh, you know, happy to close that chapter. So what is, uh, obviously we're sitting here on Halloween. What, what does November look for, like for you? Well, I, I, part of managing my farm is there's usually some, some bucks that are, that just don't have strong antler genetics that, that can out. And I'll probably spend more time with guests trying to take out some of those bucks than anything. Um, I've got, uh, a couple of bucks off of the farm that are borderline shooters mm -hmm. and I'm trying to hold off another year and hope they survive. <laughs> They're just on permission properties where they could very easily get killed. So uh, I'm guessing I'm probably going to head to Ohio and one of the three farms that I've got there. Um, we've got them set up with food plots. At least two of them have food plots on them right now. They've all got feeders. Here I am <laughs> complaining about the same. We're in the same boat, dude. Yeah. Same. Yeah. But you, you got to, to, to yep. keep the deer on your farm. You, you got to have, have feed there for them. Yep. And so... You're, you're probably not going to see me in video sitting over a feeder, but we, we have the food plots and such. So uh, I'd say there's a very good chance I'll be spending a lot of time in Ohio in November. There you go. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the most magical times of the year. You know, just to even be in the woods, I think, is, uh, you know, whether you've, you've got a tag in the pocket. I know Donnie Vincent says if, even if he shoots one, he just sits in the woods for most of the month of November and documents and watches and stuff. And so, you know, it's uh, we've got a great cold front here kicking it off kind of end of October, early November through most of the country. And, you know, I'm sure we'll see another one here. But, yeah, November is kind of that unpredictable time frame of you never know what's going to happen or you never w know what buck's going to show up, you know, the next day, basically. I, it's a great time to be in the woods. You know, you got the fall colors, especially early in the yep. month. And 
the, the bucks are running crazy and you just never know what you're going to see, what direction he's going to come from. Yeah. You know, how each hunt's going to transpire. You get into late season, you know, the bucks are, the whole deer herd's coming from bedding to food. Yeah. And it's the same pattern day after day with the rut. You know, you could shoot a buck at noon just as well as you could at, you know, seven in the morning. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time. No doubt about it. That's it. Well, we'll look forward to kind of seeing that story you're going to put in out, out on baby. Are you going to put that on the, um, the master class? Is that where it's going to go? Uh, probably going to put that one on YouTube. Okay. Um, we're, we're trying to do a better job putting more YouTube content out. The last year we've really focused on the whitetail master Academy and that's mm -hmm. where all the, just about all the video content went. We did put a little bit on YouTube, but in the coming year, we're going to be putting more on YouTube and, but we're still going to do the whitetail master Academy, which we put a new video every week out on that one. Okay. Um, at least one a week besides the chasing 200, which, you know, typically there's at least three or four of those a week. Oh, wow. So. Okay. And then, uh, I assume you and Terry will probably cover babe a little bit on the next chasing giants podcast. Yeah, I'm sure Terry, you got a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> ready to tee up for me. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, awesome, man. Well, we appreciate you taking some time in October to talk to us and, and congrats on a great buck. And we'll, we'll definitely be following along to see how the rest of the season here plays out for you. Okay. Sounds great. Cool. All right, All right man. We'll see you. Thanks, sir. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, ten, you know, whatever. Cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't yeah. matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. They can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. And awesome. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I know we... <laughs> Yeah, broken record on some stuff, but you know the big thing is uh, it's not just us. <laughs> like, like, yeah, you, well, we got an issue, dude. We're yeah. all—it's like everybody's like, "Ooh, hey, mm. this is not good. It's mm. not getting better." Yeah, and I don't want people to listen to this and think, uh, "You know, here these guys go again, attacking my rights or whatever you want to call it." Like, it—it's it, just we're nobody's trying to take anything away from you. Um, it, it's the ability to understand that. This thing, somebody has to step in and make better decisions about the resource. And I think also, I hope that people, even if you don't share the same opinions as us, kind of hear this and understand that some of the things that are coming down that are supposed to be in your favor are the one thing that is driving to work everything against you. Yeah. Doesn't matter what rights you have. The opportunity is dwindling. It's getting overutilized and it's going away. Yeah. And people, I get it. I, I, I can easily already see people commenting like, I, you're just trying to take this away from me and take this away from me. Things are going to go away from you anyways if we continue down this path. Well, not at all. I'm trying to give you back an opportunity to hunt mature yeah. bucks. And, and or just frankly, it's not even mature bucks. It's deer in general. Sure. If, if we keep going down this path, people are going to continue to gobble up more and more land and you're going to be forced into an area on public land or isolated state ground or federal ground that everybody that doesn't have private access is going to hunt, mm -hmm. which means you're not even going to hunt a deer, let alone. And it's been like that before. We've seen that in the northern tier of Pennsylvania, especially. You're going to be in an area that is overhunted with hardly any deer. So it's not just the fact like, oh, we only want you to kill mature bucks. We want you to have the ability to hunt in an area that you have a great hunting experience. And that is dwindling whether you realize it or not.
Yeah, well, because if the experience dwindles to a point where people stop hunting, then there's no point for the state to maintain those lands. And again, to Don's point, and, and even us selfishly, like, we're going to keep hunting. We have private land. Yeah. We're going to keep hunting. We're not talking about this to benefit us. It's the fact that I don't want to see the United States of America go to a European model of wildlife conservation. That's not what this country was founded on. That's not how I grew up hunting. That's not how I want my kids or grandkids to grow up hunting. But we're going to keep going that way with the more liberalized hunting seasons that we have in these states and the laws that follow those seasons. It's not going to be good for anybody. Um, but it, again, to Don's point, I thought he made a great example. Like, we're, we're, we're not going to be very affected by this, right? Like, oh, when this all goes well, away. We are and we aren't. I mean, it's just. We're uh, still going to have land. We're going to be able to hunt. We're, we're, we'll still have places that we can find mature deer. We'll still be able to, you know, wet our own whistle with it. It's everybody else who's going to consistently have shittier and shittier and shittier hunting experiences. And they're going to blame us. They're going to say, well, these are the guys gobbling up land, or these are the guys who are trophy hunters, or whatever. It is. It's not us. It's the state putting all people who care about the deer and care about hunting more than these people do that are going to consume more and more land and push you out. Well, there's a common like you know theme on our end of things. It's like do, I don't, I don't want to bait. I, I don't want to have to do that in order for me to achieve my goal at hunting. And the same way, it's like I don't want to have to buy property. I don't have to like, ex, ex, you know, extend myself to a point where it's like I'm, I have to buy property yeah. to be able to hunt. Like, I don't want anybody to have to do that. Like, and there's no point for it. Like, there's we can manage the resource in a way that people have access to good hunting. Uh, without us having to do these things. And it's just, you know, that's, I think th those are the issues we're trying to address here. Yep. Pretty crazy. But if, at the end of the day, if it comes down to it where we're not going to address those and I can either have a place to hunt or I'm not, you better believe I'm going to have a place to hunt. Place to yeah. Hunt. I'm going to do what I have to, to, to secure that. And people will do that. And that's ultimately is what will lead to we're seeing it. the decline of access. There's is, a reason yeah. that recreational land is selling at seven, eight thousand dollars an acre in some of these states. Mind blowing. I can't believe and is that people for are paying. I can't yeah. believe people are paying that, but it's because they care about hunting so much that they're going to put themselves in the game no matter the cost. Yep. That's just how it is. Yep. And yes, is it turning hunting into a rich man sport? Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. And those guys are the same way. I mean, I feel like we can speak for them. It's like they're not just buying more land to buy more land. No, they're you know they're buying more land to preserve what's less of the uh, what's left of the hunting opportunity. I think a lot of these guys have delayed putting off buying land, and they're finally realizing if I don't put my thumb in the hole now, I'm going to leak out. Yeah. And so they finally take a dive in, and they're ta every person every year is diving in at a higher price. Yep. And I don't think it's going to stop. People asked the other day, like, where, where do you think this is going to cap out? I was going to say, man, I don't know. I don't see people paying $9,000 an acre. For, they are right now. Yeah. They're a farm selling for $9,000 an acre. Well, you know, and if people think that, you know, you and I are selfish, just like literally if, if we could um, – if, if we could improve the resource to a point where the, there's no reason for people to pay top dollar for this property anymore, that would hurt our property value. And yes. I, frankly, I would prefer it. I would prefer, I would, if yeah. our land value would not appreciate a dollar more and it or it would stagnate, mm -hmm. but the hunting opportunity was better for us and for everybody else, I, that's, I, I would say that's a more important. Yeah, that would be it, man. Well, uh, if you're listening to this still and it's October 31st, spooky Halloween, Nick, uh, jump on to the live podcast, 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern tonight. We're going to do YouTube Live, hopefully, and it'll be cool. Uh, if not, we hope you enjoyed this. Uh, you're getting ready or you're into November when you're listening to this, and best time of the year, man. Coming up next, Mr. Mark Jury. Mark Jury. We're going to jump right on with him here. So. so, Anyways, we appreciate Don Higgins, episode 145. 154. 154? God, what am I, dyslexic? <laughs> uh, you read top to bo bottom to top? <laughs> yeah. Episode like, 154. Like me? Don Higgins. We appreciate y'all listening, and we'll catch you next week. Later. It's take me oh.